Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of facilitation and transformative leadership. Some leaders exert tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly transformative experience. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to join us live for a session sometime, you can join our facilitation lab. It's a free event to meet facilitators and explore new techniques so you can apply the things you learn in the podcast in real time with other facilitators. Sign up today at vulturecontrol.com slash facilitation dash lab. You can also learn more about our 12-week facilitation certification program at voltagecontrol.com. Today, I'm with Tim Creasy, Chief Innovation Officer at ProSci. Tim is a dynamic presenter, researcher, and thought leader on managing the people side of change. His work forms the foundation of the largest body of knowledge in the world on change management and is passionate about helping people unlock the challenges of change. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, Douglas. Glad to be here. It's great to have you. This is a topic that's near and dear to me, and uh, I often call myself a change junkie because if I'm anywhere uh, that's uh, staying the same for too long, I get really antsy. <laughs> so, uh, so I like to talk about change, and I like to think about what makes change more comfortable for folks. And so I'm excited to talk here with you today. What brought you into the field of change? What inspires you to do this work? What's the origin story of Tim? Yeah, I love the origin story. Uh, we're big Marvel fans at our house. So uh, I've actually been at ProSci almost 22 years now. Um, joined right out of undergrad. So I'll go all the way back to undergrad. Uh, Started as a mechanical engineering student, but realized very early on I liked human systems way better than mechanical systems. Uh, And I also loved what makes people decide to do what it is they do. Uh, So coming out of engineering, I was in business for a little bit, in psychology for a little bit. Ultimately landed with a double major in economics and political science. uh, Because I felt like both economics and political science give you interesting perspectives on what make people decide to do what they do. Uh, I got out of undergrad in three and a half years, and my uh, girlfriend at the time, now partner in life, uh, she was doing a teaching degree, so she had to do something for an extra year. So I was just looking for a job near Northern Colorado um, because I was going to go get a PhD in comparative economics and teach economics. That was the plan. It was just dialed in. Uh, that's what I wanted to bring to life. So I ended up uh, looking for jobs around Northern Colorado and found a three-month gig at a company called ProSci. Uh, at the time, we were nine employees. We're up over 350 now. Uh, and we did a lot of different business at the time uh, in the business process reengineering and call center operation spaces. Uh, We had a change management component, but that was just a little piece of the puzzle. Uh, So I started in that three-month gig uh, at ProSci, and the rest is history. Uh, You know, uh, ProSci began to really put a focus on the change management component, do more research, more development there. Uh, And what I found is that change management, I don't know, people either love or hate economics. I'm not sure which camp you fell into. Uh, But there was macroeconomics, how the whole economy works, microeconomics, how a firm makes decisions. Change management as a discipline, I think, gets at micro microeconomics. How do we as human beings navigate these contexts and situations and environments we're in? What makes us uh, be more effective, more successful, more productive? Where do things get challenging and tricky? Uh, And when you're implementing change over and over and at scale in organizations, are there repeatable things we can learn by doing the research to equip other change practitioners as they go forward? So uh, my journey at ProSci has really been part of that ProSci's journey as well over those, those 20 years. It's interesting. I also come from a, a technical background. I was um, wrote software for a number of years, and I agree with you. I found the human systems to be much more fascinating, much more complex, right? Uh, right. Puzzling at times. And so I, I'm curious to hear about your journey about the realization around the human systems and what were some of the things that you were noticing? Or maybe were there any pivotal stories or examples that come to mind? 
Well, I think a good bit of it was watching the intersection of economics and political science actually come to life during during undergrad, because in economics, you assume logical man with perfect information. You have to put all these assumptions in to get the economics models to work right. But I always kind of stepped back and said, you know what, there's a lot more moving parts that are causing what's happening to happen, right? There's influences that we're not taking in consideration or assuming out of the equation. Um, I got into systems, the notion of systems thinking, even younger in high school. Uh, we had a uh, humanities teacher that showed us a movie called, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the name of the movie, Mind Walk, I think. Uh, it's three folks walking around Mont Saint-Michel, this castle uh, off the coast of France. Uh, one of them has just failed to win the presidential election. The other is his old friend and speechwriter who has now escaped to France. And then the other is a physicist. Uh, and they begin walking around Mont Saint-Michel and just talk about systems theory. And so that was kind of what initially sparked, sparked kind of my interest in the notion that there's everything is multivariate equations, right? Mm. Um, and it's all about figuring out what are the different variables that are having an impact on the thing you're you're trying to make sense of. It's really fascinating too if you fast forward to now with these large language models that are essentially transforming everything into language and able to create models that uh, that are really un. Um, we just have no ability to understand how they work, right? Um, at, at their fundamental level. And uh, that's fascinating to me to think how those things evolve and do they start to model things that, uh, you know, expose us to higher levels of thinking. Absolutely. And I think my other interesting takeaway right now on generative AI is if, if we think about it, um, conversation is the very first form of passing information. Right, way back from the very beginning, it was through conversation that we passed information. And then we started to have massive amounts of information available in different ways, whether it was in books or all of a sudden in zeros and ones. And so the interface to information changed from conversation, right? You learned the Dewey Decimal System to find the right book. You learned how to interface with a computer, first with just a keyboard, but then with a mouse, and you could click and you could engage information in a different way now that there was all this digital information available, but it hadn't got back to conversation yet. And I think what's interesting is a lot of what's happening in generative AI is bringing access to ma massive amounts of digital information back to conversation, which was ultimately our first, first form of passing information back and forth. So... Yeah, and I think the beauty is that they've simplified it to the point where they're treating everything like language, whether it's an image or a movie or, you know, there's some form of expression, information that's being exchanged. And to to use your point, if you go all the way back, there were cave paintings before they were even language, right? And they were communicating through these symbols and these images. And if we treat things as language, then the models can get really, really good at that. And we don't have these various different fields of study, like, oh, there's computer vision or this or that. Everything starts, all the efforts start to coalesce into one stream of effort, which is really profound, right? We get more, more done. Yeah, absolutely. My other favorite take on uh, generative AI comes from, you're in the, I think your background's in music, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Rick Rubin, getting interviewed by Tim Ferriss, uh, who also has a background in creatives, right? Uh, and he says, what's your take on what this might do to create creativity? And Ruben uses the analogy of being a, of, of crate diving as a hip-hop producer. You know, back in the day, you pop pull tape after tape after tape after tape. You're just sitting there. And he said, you're not listening for the new artist or the next new song. You're listening for a moment, a moment to inspire. And in the same way, the phrase he used is, as an ends... Generative AI isn't interesting to me, but as a means, it's fascinating. Because it, very much like that crate diving, gives us huge sample sizes of potential moments that we can pick up. So, Yeah, I, I think of it as how do we augment our teams? Like teaming with AI is such a fascinating concept to me. It's not like, oh, let's just have it you know, go do all the work for us. It's like, 
I don't know, just imagine we were able to hire another person and they're with us saying things that in ways that we don't say things. And it makes us uh, realize like, oh, wow, look at this tape I just found out of this crate, right? It's like, uh, just jogs the the thoughts in ways that uh, are unanticipated. Yeah, for sure. When you get to start to riff with it, like you get two, three, four, five, six, seven rounds into riffing back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, here's a fun facilitation trick with AI is to ask it what questions I should be asking myself. Mm, yep. All the advice out there is, you know, how to prompt it to give you the answers. What if you just had it help you come up with the right questions? You want to know my one of my favorite quotes from the last couple of years? Uh, and I attribute it to Lisa Kempton on my product team. And she said she picked it up somewhere, but I'm a really good Googler and I've not found it anywhere else. But the quote is, Answers have an expiration date. Questions last a lifetime. Mm, I love that. Uh, right? And especially over the course of the pandemic response, you know, if you ran around with answers, those things were expired well before they ever landed. But if you can equip yourself with great questions to be asked and answered and re-asked and re-answered, that's the way we, uh, interesting, that's the way we bring about change. I also think that's the way we effectively facilitate, right? Um, and you just added that's a really interesting way to, to use generative AI, right, to give us those questions that uh, will help us continue to expand. So, Yeah, and I want to come back to another point you made about the, you know, there's the macroeconomics, there's the microeconomics, and then, you know, this change piece being the micro micro. So I, let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the you know part of we have this kind of tenant at ProSci that organizations don't change, individuals do, mm. uh, and so when uh, and we do this, it's a three day program. It's kind of our cornerstone program. But one of the neat things about it is people have to build a presentation while they learn it. Uh, and I used to fly down and watch people give these presentations at the end of the second day on the project they brought, the people side challenges, how they're going to tackle it. And I distinctly remember one time I flew down and the first woman that got up was presenting about a global diversity strategy. They were rolling out across 65,000 person multinational. She talked about the awareness of the need for change, the importance of sponsorship, the anticipated resistance, and really laid out her strategy. The next person got up, and she worked at an architectural engineering firm. And she managed a team of seven what they called visual communicators, people that would take really complex ideas and explain them to somebody like me, not making assumptions about your understanding, but I don't understand that stuff at all. So how do they help me understand these complex engineering principles? Seven creative people trying to bring a little bit of process so that they could have a bigger impact in their organization. And she talked about the anticipated resistance, the importance of sponsorships, how critical it was to answer why, why now, what if we don't? And so it was really neat in you know, the juxtaposition of seven creatives bringing a little bit of process to how they work and 65,000 person multinational. But the common denominator across all is human beings showing up and then needing to show up in a different way. You want to hear a joke along these lines? Sure, yeah. Uh, it, it pan, it crashes every time I tell it. Uh, I told it on stage in front of 750 people at a big Gartner business process reengineering uh, conference one time back in 2014. Uh, do you know why you never trust an atom, like an ATOM, an atom? Mm. Because they make up everything. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> so science jokes, math jokes, grammar jokes uh, are some of my favorites, but in the same way the atom makes up everything, individual human beings make up everything in the organization. They make up the teams, they make up the departments, they make up the functions, they make up the momentum, they make up the culture. And so if we want to understand change and bring about more successful change, then at the individual level is where we need to make sure we get started. Yeah, it reminds me of complexity theory and this idea that, you know, local solutions to global problems is the approach we need to take when we're inside of a complex adaptive system. Yeah, absolutely. Because local is where things actually end up happening, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of our learned behaviors and our conditioning in the business world is rooted in the industrial era and coming from Taylorism. And so it's really interesting to watch all these organizations and people struggle with this shift 
to acknowledge the fact that, you know, things aren't so reductive and aren't so simple. And we are dealing with more of a complex environment. And people can say VUCA all they want, but they still default to their old ways of working. Yeah, I think there's an interesting, certainly there's kind of the complexity piece behind. I also think in about 2016, I tried to start up a podcast with a buddy called The Rehumanization of the Workplace. Mm. Um, And it wasn't like one of these rah-rah cheerleader. It was more observational. Like, look at all these trends we're seeing across the business world that all, the common thread across them all is a revaluing of the human beings whether it's appreciative inquiry, change management, uh, a lot of the DEI work. Um, there was a common thread, even back then, 2015, 16, of revaluing the human being that makes up the organization. Now, I've got a little bit of an economics background as to why that is. Because um, the Taylorism perspective really comes, if we go to how does an organization create value, In an agricultural economy, we create value by growing stuff. In an industrial economy, we create value by making stuff. Service economy, by uh, doing stuff. Knowledge economy, by knowing stuff. And now we're actually getting into this next phase that I've sometimes called the interaction economy, where we actually create value by connecting. You think about Airbnb, Uber, all of these big organizations with no assets and it's kind of interesting they have no assets but what's more interesting is how do they actually create value and they create value by connecting somebody with a house and someone who needs a house somebody with a car and someone who needs a ride now you think about as we evolve from creating value through growing something making something doing something knowing something connecting people the human being plays a different role in each of those equations the unique value that the human bring being brings. Um, So my grandpa had a farm in central Illinois. He didn't want people getting creative necessarily on the planting there. I mean, he had decades, generations of established knowledge in what they were doing there. That's very different than bringing somebody into a service organization and having them solve a challenge that's sitting in front of them. So uh, yeah, complexity, uh, the level of connectedness we all have, the and then this evolution in economy, I think, all plays a role in a wild time that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the way you describe that because, you know, complexity kind of gets nerdy and, and, and sciencey, where it's really under, easy to understand the shift to connection. And anytime you're thinking about connection, you're moving away from something that's mechanistic and something that's more humanistic. And also, the more connections you have, the more complexity there is. So I think they're very interwoven and pretty much the same thing. It's just what's the cause versus what's the effect or what's the theory versus the practical what's happening on the ground. Absolutely. And sometimes those connections is, can actually be the antidote to ambiguity and uncertainty, mm-hmm. right? Um, like I remember uh, I was flying down to Colorado to visit headquarters one time. Uh, Northern Colorado, it's in December. So there's a chance that there's going to be a snowstorm. The wild thing there is, you know, there might be snow and there might not. You never have any idea when they predict a snowstorm. So I wake up in the er morning early, getting ready to go catch my flight here in Idaho. And I jump on Facebook and say, hey, friends in northern Colorado, did the snowstorm pan out? Jump in the shower, jump out of the shower. And eight minutes later, I had five, six accounts from the entire front range about how much snow or fell or didn't fall, right? Uh, that's not an uncertain world when we talk about VUCA, right? The wild thing is, right, when I was making that trip, I was also reading Unbroken, uh, the book about, what's his name, Zipperilli? <sighs> He's the runner, four minute mm, mile, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was captured a POW in Japan during World War I. Uh, the part of the book that struck me is his parents didn't know he had survived until he showed up and knocked on the door. There was no access to information that flowed all the way to them that they knew he was alive. Now, so access to information that comes through connection actually helps us combat uncertainty, combat the ambiguity. Um, that we have in front of us right now. So Yeah, you know, sources of information are great. You know, I think that also 
the, the, the sheer quantity can sometimes be overwhelming, right? Because the weather is concrete, knowable. If someone's there on the ground, they can say, yes, I can test this. It is snowing. When you get into more nuanced things where feelings and, and uh, belief systems are at play, then uh, when we were talking about getting into the real humanistic stuff, now we have to honor everyone's, you know, uh, lived experiences and beliefs and interpretations of what's happening. And then we have to synthesize and collate those things. And the more we have, the more difficult that challenge is. So it's interesting because the connectivity, the network is a powerful tool if we leverage it. But we also have to think about how we leverage it and how the communication structure is in place and how, how we're delineating data that's like knowable versus maybe squishier. Yeah, for sure. So I want to come back to a quote that we had talked about in the pre-show chat. And this is a quote from the creator of Adcar. And I had, had never seen this quote before. I was familiar with ProSci and Adcar, but you pointed this quote out to me. And I love it so much. Because it really does embrace a lot of the principles and qualities of facilitation and why we do what we do. So I, I love the synergy there. And I'm, I'm just going to read this out and then maybe we can kind of unpack this a little more together. But the secret of successful change lies beyond the visible and busy activities that surround change. Successful change at its core is rooted in something much simpler, how to facilitate change with one person. So what is what? When you think about that quote, I mean, you've been at ProSci for 22 years, so I'm sure you've thought about this quite a bit. But uh, when, you, when you return to that quote that's so familiar, what really is centering for you there? Yeah, there's really kind of two sides of that quote that come out to me. Um, one is, you know, ProSci and ADCAR, as you mentioned, ADCAR is that individual change model, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. And that really describes the individual outcomes of a successful change journey when we're trying to bring to life whatever change might be going on at work. And so I think there's that one aspect uh, of the quote, that it gives us guidance and some structure into which we can start to engage and we can experiment and iterate and all that, but we're, we're doing it with some directional intent. Uh, and so I think that's one half. Uh, the other half of the uh, importance of that quote to me is the acknowledgement. And it kind of gets along the lines of you know appreciating and understanding each person's individual life journey and what they're bringing to the table. That when, even when we're rolling out teams, it's an individual change. It's an individual journey for each person who has to begin using that new, you know, online collaborative platform. Uh, each person has potential barriers that uh, might inhibit them. Each person has individual motivators that's going to help move them through desire. Um, they'll have a different relationship with how things are done today. And so, there's a really interesting, uh, you know, bringing the human beings to the table that I think change management does. Uh, and I think that quote exemplifies, or at least gives us that backdrop, that then acknowledgement of how individual the change journey is. Yeah, I wanna, super fascinated about a couple of things as well. And the first sentence, really intriguing to me because I often see people really get focused on the Gantt charts and the technology and the, uh, the implementation plan and this is how we're gonna approach the change. And I love the, how it's summarized there is the busy activities that surround change. It's the, you know, the visible, tangible things. And it, it's, I think it's so easy for us to, as, you know, as descendants of monkeys that are so good at pattern matching, like we just glom onto those things that are kind of blinking in our face. Whereas the, un, the stuff lying a couple layers deeper, the more provocative, more powerful. And, and we tend, those visible and busy activities tend to be way more in our control, right? I can, I can check a box as to whether or not I did those visible busy activities. Um, so there's more control there. I can, uh, they're, they're less ambiguous. Uh, they're just much easier to get behind and execute. And, and I think you're right. That's why we tend to see this draw to the technical side of change. Um, because it is, it always got me riled up when you, people call change management the soft side of change. Mm. Right, that the human side is the soft side of change. And I'm like, come on. The, the technical side may be incredibly complex. You take a merger or an acquisition. It might be really complex merging those financial systems, but getting people to work together in a new way, that's the harder side of the change, right? And so 
yeah, those visible busy activities. The founder of Adcar was a mechanical engineer by training. So he knew about the visible busy activities that come about optimizing a set of processes that should save the organization or tremendous, you know, tremendous amount of money. But if you can't get people around it and behind it and in front of it, then it doesn't really matter. You know, that's making me think of this whole concept of resistance to change. And, you know, while it's important to acknowledge that it's there and that we're supporting people, I think that's also a trap, just like the the visible busy stuff is a trap. If you're thinking in the terms of resistance, it's already reductive. It's already like we're already kind of demonizing those people. I'm a both ander on this one. Uh, because I do think, um, I don't think we treat people as resistors, but I do think we have, I can acknowledge that if people aren't provided the answers they inherently have as human beings when they're exposed to a change, the likelihood of resistance will go up. Yes. Which means, and, and so we call this proactive resistance management, which is just good change management, right? It's good facilitation. Answer why, why now, what if you don't? When you walk through the door, it sets the foundation for change. And if we don't do those things, we can expect resistance to manifest. So I think there's this, it's not quite egg and chicken, it's chicken and egg, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We also identify resistance that comes from not supporting people through the change and constructive resistance, which is informed objections to the decision direction we're taking as an organization, right? Yes. I have to be able to discern the two. So I have to, you know, have my head being playing heads up enough to know which one's which. And if I'm doing a good enough job supporting people. Uh, but yeah, constructive resistance is that's where we get meaningful progress. Uh, so important. Yeah, absolutely. You no, know, I think about Sloan's quote, you know, uh, where he uh, assembled his executive team and uh, postponed the meeting. He said, let's adjourn. And so we can all come up with matters of disagreement. <laughs> you know, it's like one of one of my favorite quotes ever. Yeah. And to your point, you have to have that constructive resistance or constructive conflict. And and also you have to be willing to move into it. I see so many people shy away from that stuff because they want to be soft. They want to be empathetic. They want to keep it peaceful. And it's actually long-term more peaceful if we lean into that conflict and are willing to have those discussions. Yeah, and then if I take off my kind of change management thought leader hat and put on my pro side business leader hat. Uh, Michelle Haggerty is our chief operating officer, um, just a fantastic leader, and has really brought forward the concept of being kind, not nice. Yes. Right? Because that niceness can become what I think you just described as skirting away from taking on and figuring out what it is we need to be tackling in front of us. And so... Hey, hey, yeah, niceness can often get in the way of having those important conversations, those disagreements. Um, one of her other, she's just an amazing leader. She might be worth having on your show here. One of her other concepts she brings forward, and I think it goes right alongside kind, not nice, is high expectations, high support. Mm, yes. I, and she brings both of them in spades. Um, but that, I mean, she tees up her teams to over deliver all the time. Uh, and with high expectations and high support, you have the environment into which kind, not nice can really come, come to life. So, yeah, I love that. Just, um, you know, so often leaders get stuck in the having the answers that comes back to your, your quote earlier around, you know, answers having an expiry. And, um, uh, and it's so much more powerful when leaders like you're describing she is that um, find gaps or find um, obstacles and work to remove those or work to help people with the resources they need to remove them. Yep, absolutely. And uh, to, help them, to help them feel empowered, to help spot and elevate those barriers so they can, you know, mm. so you can step in and, and help support them yeah, through it. And, yeah. That even gets into the one of the topics du jour, which is psychological safety, because people, even if they spot them, are they feel comfortable raising that because have we made it okay to point those things out, right? Because, you know, it's kind of funny to me, oftentimes, the things as simple as how do we respond when those things are brought up? Are we, are we inviting that information or are we annoyed when we hear about it? Because yeah. it can be frustrating to hear about these things that are not working, but if we have a frustrating 
response or posture, then people are likely to just, well, I might not, maybe don't bring that up. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's really the job of the leader is context setting, right? Creating the context into which nobody hesitates to bring that forward. Um, we've made it, uh, we've extended the invitation. And one of the big lessons I've learned over the years, the hard way, was me caring about what you think is different than you knowing that I care about what you think. Mm, yes. <laughs> and, and that's a bridge that's got to be crossed to create that condition of feeling invited to bring, bring that opinion. Yeah, there was an interesting study the Futures Forum did, and they were asking about autonomy in the workplace, like the post-pandemic, kind of everyone's working from home, uh, and this idea of distributed remote work and how much flexibility there is in the schedule. Because everyone's talking about, oh, we have this improved flexibility. So leaders said that there was like, you know, 80% of leaders said there was high flexibility. And they also said that employees had high flexibility. They were able to, you know, set their schedules, et cetera. Less than 40% of the employees said they felt high flexibility. So it comes to your point, like there's this perception from the leaders that it's there, but no one feels it. So it doesn't matter what the leader thinks. It matters how everyone feels. Yeah, it's absolutely what the, uh, and this goes back to one of our very core principles of change management around communication, that communication is what gets heard, not what gets said. Um, mm -hmm. And in the same way, yeah, those perceptions are what the people feel not necessarily what you're you're seeing from leaders along the vein of that i love questions um i managed to get two group big groups of uh i had a couple hundred leaders and then a couple hundred change practitioners from the same big organization different days and i asked both of the groups these these three questions what new capabilities emerged over the last three years that must be part of the future of your organization we have to incorporate them because you can't pretend we didn't grow all these capabilities that we now have. Uh, the second question, what new expectations emerged that now need to be part of how you design the future of work, the future of the organization? And then the mm. third one was a real fun one. What's it for? What's shared space for when we do come together? Uh, and really riffing off of Seth Godin design thinking art, uh, article, you know, using the what's it for as the foundation. If you're a caterer and you're catering lunch, what's that lunch in for? That's going to impact how you decide to cater it. Is it a kindergarten reunion, a celebration of life, a bachelorette party, right? Those are very different what's it fors. So we pull that thinking into the office. What is shared space for uh, if we're going to bring people into shared space? Uh, and so I ended up with some really fascinating side-by-side -side lists, right? Um, interestingly, leaders and change agents had the exact same top three lists, top three of the list, collaboration, connection, and teamwork. Mm. Getting back to our you know, discussion of connection. Uh, after that, you started to see some interesting variation uh, where change agents really elevated socializing, chance encounters, brainstorming, a bit more of those humanistic components. The leaders uh, tended to lift up uh, proper use of, you know, good use of physical space, uh, compliance, safety, some of those more structural components that shared space give us. And so... As long as we're being heads up and deciding, making the most of shared space when we use it, I think, uh, or when we bring together, that's, that's going to be the kicker going forward. You know, as you were rattling off those questions, it brought me back to a thought that I was having earlier and this idea that identity is something that is often at odds with change. But going back to, you know, cloud migrations, a lot of companies still undergoing cloud migrations, but they were definitely very, very popular, you know, you know, five, 10 years ago, a lot of people making those shifts to cloud native and your sysadmins are staring down that pathway thinking, who am I at the end of this, right? There's no more EMC servers to administrate. And so acknowledging the fact that, you know, folks may be in an identity crisis when we're having these conversations and we're appearing in the future, they might be um, arms wide open as far as the plan 
but there's some conflict. It's like, you know, getting that present for your birthday is not really quite what you wanted and you've got the smile on your face, right? And so how, getting to some of those layers, like, um, with some of these prompts and questions around, hey, uh, who, how do you see yourself at the end of this journey? It's not just like, what do we need to do as an organization, but how is this really impacting you and your vision of your career and your, your standing? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, I got a friend here in Boise named Brian Fretwell that did a, a, wrote a really nice book around, he was a runner and then all of a sudden psh, knee blew out. And that mm-hmm. notion of losing the thing that you define yourself with and around, um, and how, you know, there's, there's some challenges there. One of the things we've brought, and I'll give you a, a kind of a really, really concrete example, um, to get into this notion. We have, a framework in the ProSci methodology called the 10 aspects of job impact. So 10 aspects of somebody's job that this change may or may not impact. Processes, systems, job role, tool, critical behavior, mindset, attitude, belief, performance review, location, compensation, and there's one more that I don't remember. Um, We'll often sit down with employees who are going through change and do sort of a fill it out together as sort of a side-by-side. How does this change potentially impact these things? Um, So we're really trying to elicit and elevate that conversation about what the change actually means at that uh, individual level. Because, and you know, the sysadmins, yeah, there's particular tasks that may not need to be executed anymore. Um, Mm. But I think this gets to some of the neat developments in the HR space around being skill-oriented organizations um, because it creates the environment into which we can uh, can move people more effectively around when certain tasks. I wrote an article about AI and the impact, you know, the disruption it's going to have. And I was like, you know, task disruption is where we start and then we can start to build up. Oh my gosh, is my job gone is very different. That's not the starting point. The starting point is, what aspects of my job, what tasks that I do are highly language intensive that I can either do better, faster, or might not need to be done anymore uh, because of these new capabilities. And so, yeah, starting at that task level lets us, in the same way we start at that individual change impact level and start to you know, build up from there. Yeah, and so as we're nearing the end here, I want to shift and start to talk about the future a little bit. And, uh, you know, I'm always curious when talking with any guest, what is your perspective on how the future will unfold if we're, you know, boldly successful at the work we're trying to do? So in your case, you know, uh, thinking about change at the individual level, you know, humanizing things more, how does the world look if we're able to be more successful, if more people start behaving in these ways? Yeah, I'll bring forward, in terms of how we'll look in the future, I'll bring forward a challenge that I think I picked up during, it was, again, Tim Ferriss' podcast with Jim Collins, uh, who doesn't make his, you know, the rounds all that often. This is the 2019 one. And he's talking about Peter Drucker, one of his mentors. And he said, Drucker's big question, the big question that drove all of Drucker's work was how do we become both more productive and more human-centric at the same time? And so that was kind of the, the, the burning ember that you know, kept Drucker's work going. I think if, we're to be, if we are successful at this, what we're talking about going forward, I think we start to thread that needle that Drucker laid out for us as the challenge. Um, because we can imagine, right, it, we know it's easy to get more productive and less human-centric. Very easy to do that. We know it's easy to get more human-centric and less productive. Uh, We know that a lot of times we end up getting less productive and less human-centric. The complete miss is, can we get our leaders, our teams, our people focused on threading that needle? And I think that becomes an interesting hill worth climbing for sure. Yeah, I love that. And uh, it it makes a ton of sense, you know? Like if you over-optimize on one, one variable, the, the other sufferers. So when you think about these uh, that sometimes seem at odds with each other, there's a paradox there, right? And I think there's always richness when we explore these paradoxes that when they exist together, beautiful things emerge. So I am full-heartedly behind that mission and likewise will uh, we'll be keeping an eye on how humane we can be while also remaining productive. 
What's interesting, Douglas, is the more I played it out, I ended up kind of coming to the conclusion that getting more humane is the path to getting more productive and more successful as organizations. Um, that ultimately, just given the evolutions in organizations and how we're, we're operating today, the, the path to delivering outcomes, to landing change, to building the organization people aspire to work to is elevating that human component. So, Absolutely. And I tell people, if you, if, if you think they're rose-colored glasses, let me keep them on because I'm walk, watching organizations make meaningful progress and making meaningful decisions uh, in this direction. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It is effort worth making. And so I want to take a moment here to allow you to leave our listeners with a final thought. Uh, well, first of all, I'd really appreciate the time, Douglas. A uh, really fun, fun co- podcast to be on. So I appreciate the time today. Uh, yeah, I'm most active on LinkedIn, and I think the thing that I'm trying to bring forward. It's I decided it was my bass beat. Um, yeah, again, back to music. You know the drum beat and whole lot of love. Oh yeah, very well. And if you know Led Zeppelin, you know the drum beat and Whole Lot of Love, right? And if you know Beyonce's Lemonade, you've heard the drum beat from Whole Lot of Love because uh, he did something there, Bonham did, uh, that was sampled a couple hundred times. And that's the neat thing about a bass beat is that once you find it, it can show up in a lot of different places in a lot of different ways. So the bass beat that I've arrived at is change is hard, change is continuous, but change success is accessible with and through our people. So we all have a lot of change in front of us, a lot of things we're trying to make happen. It is with and through our people that we're going to succeed at whatever journey we're setting out upon. So that's my, uh, my, my final thought is uh, it's through your people. Yeah, and I'll just echo that by saying, we need to change together. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. It sounds like folks can find you on LinkedIn. So uh, definitely follow Tim on LinkedIn, check him out in his post. I know there's some really amazing research we didn't have time to get to today, but uh, I know the posts there are on LinkedIn. You can go check them out, read it. We'll have things like that in the show notes as well. And Tim, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. I really enjoyed it and looking forward to next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. If you want to know more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about facilitation, team dynamics, and collaboration. VoltageControl.com.